Hello and welcome everybody. I'm happy that you could join us today for today's webinar. My name is Flavio Popescu. I am a structural engineer at StruSoft Denmark. Today I will be joined by my colleagues Siavash and Yoni from our offices in Sweden and Finland respectively. Today, we will be using GoToWebinar platform. You will notice that you have a questions field in your GoToWebinar window. Please type in your questions there in the questions tab. We will go through the questions at the end, and hopefully we will manage to answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation. If we do not manage to answer all of your questions, we will send an email afterwards to follow up on everyone's question. Today, we will make, we will have a presentation which will include some theory of the steel design module. This will be done by my colleague, Yuni. Then we will move on to a presentation of, ish, of a project, namely Nordic Ham project. It is a steel project and my colleague Siavash will present the challenges and the solutions of that specific project. Siavash is the design engineer responsible for the project at hand. After that, as said, we will go through any questions that you might have and have written in the questions field. Even though today we are talking about FEM design, StruSoft has a wide range of structural, of structural analysis software and not only. Apart from FEM design, we have WinStatic, which is single element analysis and design program. BIM Energy, focused on energy efficiency in buildings. Impact precast and reinforcement for concrete factories. And pre-stress for pre-stressed beams and hollow core elements. So StruSoft has, a, has several software that it manufactures and distributes. We have more than 10,000 users using our software. You can see a large concentration of them in Scandinavia. We also have a lot of users in the rest of Europe and North Africa and even Asia. We have offices around the globe. As you can see, we have three offices in Denmark and three in Sweden. And then we have other offices around Europe and the world, most recently in Finland, Scandinavia. Let's go back to Fem Design and talk a little bit more about Fem Design, the software on focus today. You can do a lot in FemDesign. Some of you may have used it already in your projects. Some of you are, will be seeing it for the first time or hearing about it for the first time. Some of the main topics that make design, that make FemDesign special is the ability to draw and model after DWG drawings. These are often used as references to build up from them, use the DPG drawing as a reference and start modeling in 3D. It is also possible to import 3D drawings into FemDesign and model directly on the drawings. We will look, we will be looking at the steel design module in detail today. 
and having a lot of focus on that. It is possible to design fuel beams as shell elements, as a finite element analysis. Very powerful tool for designing concrete. It is possible to do a concrete section analysis, which takes into account the reinforcement in the concrete and differences in stiffnesses according to cracks. Of course, auto design of steel and of timber. There is also a new, completely new design engine for CLT panels. This is not the focus for today, but it is very, very relevant to mention it. Of course, please look at our website, www.strusoft.com, to read more about all of these features, including the 3D soil module, which is also possible to, to design in FEM design. It treats the soil module as 3D finite elements, so you can get an actual realistic behavior of the soil instead of the classical spring model. Okay, let's go and focus now on the steel design module. I will hand over the presentation to my colleague Yuni. Hi Yuni. Hi, and uh, for the beginning I would like to say say thank you that I'm I'm now part of this big family of the of the users of this this great software. So it's a, it's a good to be in this team. Okay. Um, do you, Flavio? Do you have anything else? I think not. No. Nope. So I. I no, you are. Okay, you can go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. So um, I I want to talk about like this is a really really demanding technically dem demanding project. So that's why I wanted to talk like. 10 minutes about the theory behind the, the decisions made in this project and you kind of forget the idea how how these these projects are designed in the in the Eurocode 3. So I'm first gonna discuss about the structural system choices. So what kind of uh, structural systems you can use in these these structures and then some analytical model choices and finally some analysis method choices and these are the methods which are implemented in the Eurocode. And uh, by the way, they are also really well implemented in FEM design. So we will kind of have follow the work path how they, they have been implemented in the FEM design. So we start with the uh, structural system choices we have made or Siavas has made in this project. So usually, first you usually design the vertical load support system. So this means like roof beams or, or trusses of, of steel structure and usually you have a like you have a span length and then you have it have a height of the of the element or height of the truss or the beam and there are some 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 practical usually these practical limits what you usually want to concentrate on because okay let's say we are using trusses in this project and usually the typical area to apply trusses is that the span length and the height of the trusses should be like 12 or 15. And the reason for this decision is that then the trusses will be most financial, financial uh, efficient structural system. If you go over this limit, it doesn't mean that it cannot take the load, but it will mean that uh, the design will be much more demanding. And especially in this project, we have, we have kind of a bit outside the typical scope of the trusses. And what it means that the connection forces will be really high in this project because the, the span length is really high and the height of the trusses are really low. And um, that's why it's also very demand, uh, demanding task to, to design this truss. So usually you should stick to this rule that you take the span and the height of the truss should be like span divided by 12. And then you internal forces and truss 
node connection design is not too demanding. But anyway, you have a FEM design which will design those connections really well. So you do not have any problems with this demanding type of trusses we have in this, this, this project. But it's a good to have this, this kind of idea in your mind that when, when is the welded beam is a suitable model and when the truss is suitable structural model. And especially those columns in this project, we have applied the welded beam model. And uh, if you look at this, this span height requirement or, or recommendation, it's a kind of a well, well, uh, well, very good, good place to apply this, this, this welded beam because we have a lot of lateral loads and we, we are somewhere in this area. The hostel beams are kind of out of the question because of the span, span limit. So we are, we are in the welded beam region on the, on the columns. Anyway, let's continue. Then we have to design the, the lateral load support system. So it means that uh, which, which is a system which will take the wind load and wind load is the main loading of this project. And usually this table you have here is, is more kind of uh, for, for normal buildings. And usually those hall type buildings, which do not have a lot of internal columns and not of not lot of beams, this table is not, not very good. And, uh, that's why usually it says that you can make like 20 stories size buildings with the moment resisting frames, but it only applies on, on traditional office buildings and residential buildings. With this, this whole type building, you, you are kind of a, a limited to something like eight or five stories. And even then it's a, it's a really difficult. Usually they are like two stories high, And after that, it has to be a braced frame. But anyway, it's a good if you design on kind of a normal buildings. This is kind of a good good rule of thumb how you design your lateral load support system. And there are many sub subtypes of these bracings, but it's out of the scope of this 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 presentation. Uh, then, when you want to design these these lateral load resisting systems, it's a it's a good idea to know is it a non sway or sway frame. And usually people have the idea that uh, these type of frames which have a bracing, they are called non-sway, but that is not the case, case in reality and in the Euro code, because this type of frame can be also sway, because if we have a really flimsy bracing system, it means that the sway effects are really high as they are in this project. So you have to really con consider is this a sway or non-sway system. Just by looking at the structure, you cannot tell. And that's a good that you can model really complex structures in FEM design. You have to model this problem to really answer this question. Is it the non-sway or, or sway system? So usually it's if you start your career, you kind of think that these are this is a non-sway and this is way. And by the way, this this lower picture, this can be also non-sway. If the columns are really thick, then is uh, this can be also non-sway system. And usually those sway systems, they are really sensitive to the to the lateral deformations and 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 the second order effects. That's why we have this this classification system. And um, then we have another kind of a topic which kind of makes things even more complex. And, and, and Siavas will talk about this, that we can have a statically determined bracing systems. It means that all the lateral loads goes through the bracing. So if we have a pinned columns in the column faces, all the wind loads has to go through the bracing system. But if we have a fixed connections and really high stiffness beams, we have a kind of a mixed system. So it's a statically indeterminate system. It means that the lateral loads will go through many routes to the foundations with the bracing system and with the columns. And it's kind of a really demanding to design these kind of a mixed systems, what this is. is. And uh, okay, we talk about more about this, that what is nominally pinned and nominally semi-rigid connections, because um, just by looking at the connection, it's really difficult to tell. And according to the Eurocode, you should always classify your connections or, or choose your connection system before you kind of start to design your bracings, because let's see, you have a different type of connections. You have connection type one, type two, type three, Okay, usually these like this this type of four or, or type of seven, they are pinned connections. Usually you don't even have to calculate to know that this is a pinned connection. But it might be also the case if you look at that, that connection number two here. 
Depending on the thickness of the end plates, this type of connection can be also pinned and same applies to the, uh, the, those column footings. So if you, if you go back to here, if you think about is this pinned connection or, or, or rigid connection, you have to look at the real stiffness of the connection and compare it to the stiffness of the beam or stiffness of the column. So actually you, you look at the ratio between the, the connection stiffness and the column stiffness or the beam stiffness. But the FM design can use, help you a lot here because you have this connection design module which will tell you the, exactly the stiffness and it will also tell you where you classify your connection. So you know is it rigid or semi-rigid or flexible. Okay. And by the way, according to Eurocode, if you look at the basic Eurocode clause 5, 2, 1, it states that you should include the stiffness of the connections in your, in your total analysis model. So it's, it's nothing that you might do, you have to do it. And, and FEM design will help you because it's so easy in FEM design. Okay. Then you might have some choices how you model your, your structures and in FEM design, like Flavio said, you have really good options. You can use traditional beam elements and if you have a beam element, it's really easy to convert to shell model. And why you want to do this, why you want to make one shell model in the, in the beam model. If you look at this picture, usually the, the engineering decision, what kind of a, uh, analytical model do you use to model element? It based on the height of the element and the span length of the element. If you're to talking about this, this picture is kind of a confusing because it's a solid and a pixel, but you can apply that, that uh, think that this, this shell means actually beam, this means beam, and this means like a shell model of the beam. So if the span length is really low and the beam is really high, you should use like, um, uh, this, this shell model. It's a one, one reason to use it. And if the vice versa, if you have really high span length on your column or your beam, like let's say like the 0.5 or no, sorry, 0.1 or something, you see that application area of the, of the shell model is no longer valid here. Actually, the beam model is better here. This is usually people don't think about it, that it's, it's possible, but actually beam model is better when you have a really high span length and, and really low beam, because it's so difficult to make, so make enough if E elements in, 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 in low height beam. And if you have only few FE elements in the, in the height direction of the beam, then the uh, result accuracy is really low. So there are areas where you, where you should apply a shell model and there are areas where you should apply beam model. And the other reason to apply this shell model is that if you have some details on your beams like stiffening, so you want to calculate the lateral torsional buckling, then the beam model or shell model is really, really good. But this is kind of something you have to keep in mind always that in the, in the really high beams and low span lengths, the, the arching effect makes it so that beam model is no longer applicable. And if you have a really high beam, long beam and low height beam, then, then the, actually the beam model is better. To, uh, to describe the problem. And then you have also, also kind of non-linear uh, methods you can use. So uh, you have basically uh, your, your analysis can be divided in three different sections. You have a uh, linear analysis, which is really simple. Material does not have any yield limit. It, it behaves on compression and tension side same ways, supports acts a compression tension they act the same way as both, both ways. And elements can take the tension or compression like the braces. And uh, now Shiavas has selected this method, materially nonlinear analysis. It means that there's something nonlinear in the model. Uh, for instance, this case, he, he has, uh, has nonlinear support. So it means that, uh, for instance, material can have a yield limit or supports can have uplift. And this is the case in this project. So actually it behaves on compression and tension side differently. And then you can have a like totally materially and geometrically nonlinear analysis. And you can also do this in FEM design. So you can apply uplift to the foundations and you can, you can calculate it geometrically nonlinear fashion. So you can apply both and it's uh, up to you which kind of these methods you use. But Eurocode will give you recommendation if you follow the, the guidelines on next, next slides. 
And before we look at the, those guidelines, what kind of analysis you should use, you first has to understand these uh, geometric deviations what are defined in the Euro code. So you can have a sway deformation. This means that the whole building is not perfectly vertical. Then you can have a bow deformations defined in table 5.1 in Euro code. It means that every column or brace is not perfectly straight. It has some kind of a eccentricity in the middle. And then you have also, this is something that people usually don't use, but it's a bracing eccentricity. It means that if you have a truss in your model, truss cannot be perfectly straight. It has to, has to have some kind of a deformation in the middle to have forces in the bracing system. So this is the way how you calculate the bracing system forces in Eurocode. Of course, it has to take also wind loads plus this load caused by the is geometric imperfections of, of the truss upper cord. So three types of uh, uh, deviations in the Euro code. And actually there are four, but I don't want to mess this up too much because it's a kind of a complex, but in the splices, column or beam splices, you, you also have a eccentricity there, but it's not here. Okay. So you also have to understand what is alpha critical. And it's, it's defined that uh, we, if you calculate the ultimate limit state combination, if you multiply the loads by a certain factor, you will lose the stability in the elastic mode. So it means that this is not the right, uh, not, not the load bearing capacity of the truck. So it's just that when the elastic instability happens, like the Euler buckling, buckling strength, not the total or exa exact strength of the structure. And uh, it's defined in the Eurocode clause 521. Uh, and Fab design can also help you really a lot here because it's so easy to make uh, stability analysis in FEM design. And by the way, you have also approximation of the of, of the of the alpha critical in Eurocode, what you can apply to this project. But it's only approximation. FEM design will give you much more, more accurate value for this alpha critical. So you just run the stability analysis and you, you know your alpha critical right away, pretty accurate fashion. If your connection stiffness have been inputted in the model, as they should be. Okay. So this is really confusing at the first. I think um, I can I can leave this this as a screenshot or something in the in the in the in the seminar system or something if you want to have this picture. But this is actually describes how the analysis goes according to the Eurocode. It seems to be really complex, but uh, basically most of your structures they go really simple path. So it's actually not that complex as this seems at first. But we start here at the top left corner. We have a structural system and we have a connection system. And now it's important to know that we also have to have the connection systems ready before we start this, this buckling or alpha critical analysis. And there we have a connection stiffness, which is defined in the, in the Euro code three subpart eight. And this is the clause number, which defines the connection stiffnesses. And the FEM design will cal calculate these automatically, will you? And FEM design will even put this back to the statics model for you. So you don't, it's a fully automated process. If, if you just define the connection, they will be there. Then you calculate your alpha critical. And if you're using elastic verification, you, you should check that the alpha critical is higher than 10. Okay, easy. Then it can be called a non-sway structure. Okay, what about if the alpha critical is like below then? Okay, then you have to go here and then inspect if the alpha critical is even higher than three, you still can use uh, first order analysis if you increase the lateral loads by this factor. And it's, it's uh, explained here. It can be applied to the one story buildings or constant multi-story buildings. And this is really easy also implementing FEM design. You can also increase the or use the sway mode, buckling modes in, but I haven't put it here, but let's make it simple. I use always myself this method, but this is also applicable to FEM design. And then you should include your sway imperfections in the model. But usually in the steel structures, this clause will apply. But usually in steel structures, is it so that the horizontal loads are so high compared to the vertical loads that actually you don't need any sway imperfections on your linear model. So if the alpha critical is high, and usually your normal models, they are really high, you can go right away here. You can forget the sway imperfections. Truss imperfections, you cannot forget. They, they, you have to do it if you want to design roof trusses. 
I usually do it so that I calculate the model and apply, make a separate load case of these imperfections and calculate them afterwards and add them to the design of the structure. And you can call your structure as a non-sway because it's not that sensitive for the, for the sway effects. And then it's easy. First order analysis and you go through the normal design path. And if, if the case is that alpha critical is really, really low, even below three, it's, a, it's, it's really a sway system. This is kind of a semi-sway system when you have to increase the lateral loads. But if you have this sway system, then you have to model the imperfections. And the design will automatically do this. If you just calculate the imperfection analysis, they will be there. And bow imperfection is the same thing. You will also have these bow imperfections on your model. And of course, truss imperfections, they apply as they apply in the, in the linear calculation. And then you run your non-linear analysis. You just, it's really easy in FEM design. You just click the non-second order effects on with the load combination and it will automatically work. And then again, you go through the same path, but here you could have an option in a FEM design and in the Eurocode. If you have put on your sway columns, your, your imperfections, your sway and uh, bow imperfections on your model, you don't have to do the flexra or torsional buckling checks because they are included in the nonlinear FEM model. But nonlinear FEM model should always have the imperfections in the model. So that's why it's important. You have to know yourself which elements have an imperfection and which do not have. And if you know that this column has an imperfection, you can skip right away here that you calculate on the, the lateral torsional buckling and interaction. And of course, if you have a shell model on your, on your, on your FEM design model, then you don't even have to do that one. You only have to do the cross-section classification to roughly know is there any local buckling, buckling phenomenon to govern the design. So I won't, won't explain this more. It's kind of a be, uh, good idea if you look at like uh, really slowly yourself to understand this process, but that's roughly it. You have to che check your alpha critical and most of your structures go right away here. So how you have worked previously, it's just fine. But if you have a demanding project like this one, we might be in this uh, small sway effects zone and we, we want, might want to increase the lateral loads by this factor. So just a few pictures more about how, how the things are applied to the FEM design. So your alpha critical, like I said, just make a stability analysis and FEM design will automatically tell you the alpha critical. And if you have modeled the connection in the column basis and here, the stiffnesses will be in the model if you have updated from the connection module. So you have re really the correct alpha critical parameters here. So you can see, okay, now it's a four. It means that I have to increase my sway effects. And the sway effects can be increased by, by increasing the load factors of the, of the lateral loads. Like here, this is from the Euro code. Uh, verticals may be calculated by increasing the horizontal loads in, for instance, wind loads. So that's what I have done here. I have calculated my alpha critical with the FEM design and put it as a, as a factor for, for lateral loads. And that's easy. It's, it's really, really easy to do, you see. Yeah. If the alpha critical is higher than, than three, if it's the lower than three, then you have to run the nonlinear analysis. The imperfections, they are here. You have an imperfection analysis and you can calculate how many imperfections you want based on the buckling analysis. Of course, you have first have to have a stability analysis and then you can apply these imperfections in your model. And the last step is when you're designing elements, compression elements in demanding structures in FEM design, you can design, decide yourself as an engineer, what kind of effects do you use? And right now I have selected this method. It says consider second order analysis if available. And what happens in the report, it says that it's not necessary to calculate the flexural buckling because we have a second order analysis. But you have to know, FEM design doesn't know, do you have a bow or sway imperfections in, your, in, in this element or not? If you have it, then it's fully correct. If you go, go back like a few slides, I can, I can. So we were here on the, on the right side, this process. So if we have these sway imperfections in the column, we do not have flexural boxing, torsional buckling. We only need to take, take into account this. And if you have a shell model, this is also included in the shell model, but then you have to have also deformations of the, of the flanges, which is kind of a complex. But anyway, even that is possible. 
So I don't I don't want to mix you up anymore, but let's let's give uh, Shivas a, a go. So Shivas, can you can you continue from here? Yes, I will continue. Now let me just uh, share screen. So let me perfect. This is my screen. Siavash, before you begin, just want to remind everybody to type in your questions if you have any in the questions field. That way we'll be able to see them and take them at the end of the presentation. Thanks. Perfect, perfect. Now, uh, uh, the map that Uni showed you on how to design according to Eurocode, it's, uh, I would recommend for everybody to actually have a look at it. It's, it's, it's a great explanation on a very complicated issue, but if you follow the map, you will understand how the design process works. And for me, that was that map that all, I also read a long time ago that, that gave me a very much better understanding on how, how, how design is supposed to be and how the pro, pro process should look. So, uh, uh, but let's, let's continue with this uh, Harbor project. So, as you can see here, um, uh, I, I actually worked for Rumble a couple of years ago in which I was the design engineer. Uh, and uh, uh, one of their object was to actually this project which is called Norvik Sound. It's actually a new port, which is uh, supposed to be in, uh, it, it's south of Stockholm, approximately one hour from the city. And uh, it's supposed to replace uh, an already existing port. Now, this uh, new port is supposed to take uh, a lot more than, than before. Frihamnen, which was which is the existing port in, in Stockholm, can take approximately 60,000, you could say, containers. Uh, per year, while Norvik is supposed to take 500,000. And uh, the reason why this port is demanded is because uh, uh, nine of 10 goods is transported by sea to Sweden. So most of the of, uh, of goods are transported by, by sea to Sweden. And, uh, uh, and also Stockholm is actually the fastest growing city in Europe. Um, and, uh, and, and another I think why the port is located where it is is actually that it have a very good natural deep, so it allows for much larger larger cargo ships like the Federer cargo cargo ships that are yeah very huge. So uh, this is how it looks looked inside uh, inside, but this is how it's supposed to look in the end. And um, some interesting fa fact about this project that, I mean, it was approximately 50 years ago that a port was built in Sweden. Uh, it, and it also took almost 25 year, years to just get the build permission. Uh, and uh, one of the big reasons was also the environmental reasons. So much lar larger cargo ships is much better for environment compared to small cargo ships. And of course, uh, compared to trucks. Um, now, uh, what's interesting also about this project is that it's supposed to use the latest in technology. So uh, it's going to be, you could say, a test site also for for the for for the company that maintain the the, the logistic over there. And uh, it also, it's 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 a huge infrastructure project in general because it's also connecting roads, it's a lot of bridges connecting, and it's railways, and it's also tunnels. So uh, it, it's a big project. But uh, what I will be talking about today is one part of the project, which is uh, 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 this kind of vehicle cranes that is supposed to, they, they, they are stacking containers on top of each other. And they are approximately 16 meters in height. And they are supposed to be remote controlled. But in the, whole, in the future, they are supposed to be fully optimized. Now, uh, these uh, vehicle cranes, as I mentioned here, they are going. To, they are going to need a steel workshop. Uh, so uh, they need a workshop. Uh, they uh, and they're supposed to park inside there sometimes and uh, yeah, get uh, service done. Now, uh, what was about this project is that you can see that. Uh, let me give you a scale of this structure. So uh, the opening you see over here, this is actually a door opening. So you can understand that the height of this building compared to, to, uh, to uh, the scale. Um, so this is a door opening and uh, this uh, structure is approximately uh, 24 uh, meters high, 24 to 26. But this is almost equal to a six story building or seven story building, but in only one story. 
So uh, what this creates as a problem is that the columns now usually in a structure when you have when you have slabs in the middle then the, the column you could say that the column buckling length will reduce a lot to every story but here you have a very high columns and uh, uh, they are some of the columns are also class four sections they are welded uh, and uh, in initial calculation that I made on this in, in this structure it showed that it was a huge large sway in and uh, I needed to test out the structure, uh, so because this structure is is, is pretty special. So uh, should I have it as sway or non-sway? What about the boundary conditions? How sensitive is is it? So for me to be able to solve this problem, on how to simplify this model and how to calculate, uh, I needed to do some tests, and uh, it's what. Well, tests called sensitive analysis. So you pretty much change the boundary conditions and you can see what kind of critical factor you get or what kind of deformation you get, and then you make it fixed. And then you make it hinged and you can just try out. You, you, you try it uh, with different boundary conditions. And if the boundary condition seems that, well, uh, it's not a lot difference, then you can use one of the system. So in this case, it shows that that uh, for me in this case, if I'm having the columns as fixed or ha having the columns as hinged, uh, it was not the main stability, was not having the columns as fixed. Actually, hinge and fixed didn't give me a lot, you could say, difference in, in displacement. So I did simplify because I knew that because of this sensitive analysis that I did, that I could actually, uh, w without going too much in detail on the columns and exactly stiffness, uh, in this just in this case, I was able to just design it with actually hinged columns and uh, use the truss system to to stabilize instead. Um, so another thing about this structure, this is uh, maybe a little outdated picture. This is not exactly how it looks, but it's pretty much so. But uh, one thing is that this structure is supposed to allow for expansion expansion in the, in the future. So uh, it's supposed to be able to grow deeper. Uh, so we should allow for a uh, good design to allow for that. And uh, of course, this, this is uh, located in the coast. So a big problem for that was that we had huge coastal winds, which caused initial calculation, so one meter sway, one meter deformation in the top of the columns. So this is one of the challenges that, that I faced. But apart from those challenges, there was also some other things like I, I actually had to do some uh, uh, plastic calculation, non-linear calculation, non-linear non calculation. And uh, I also considered second order calculation. And uh, uh, I had uh, large uplift forces that, that caused me or that, that, that made me to do this non-linear calculation. I will show you how, how uh, you can actually find those forces also in FEM design. So I will open you the FEM design model so you can have a look at it, how it looks. And I'll also explain a bit on uh, why I modeled the way I modeled. And uh, if there is any question, just write in the chat and uh, I'll try to respond to them. Uh, but uh, something that Uni mentioned is that it's actually pretty a pretty good uh, a good rule of thumb the the values that he showed you that the span to length ratio should be a certain ratio so that otherwise it's an ineffective design and uh, for me in this in this case i actually had that limit and the reason was that i had a height limit for this structure I, and I, I'm, it was a military height limit so i was not allowed to go over a certain height and also under the structure i had some overhead cranes and i had these ports and stuff like that so the height was very very uh, restrictive on which type of height i could have and uh, so what happened there is that uh, i used a truss system which is not of course a normal truss system and i got very high joint forces um, so i had to design this and also another you could say challenge is that my welds uh, were not allowed to be more than four to five millimeter welds. Now, the reason for that is that if you're having more than five millimeter of welds, usually you have to weld twice. Um, so, and since there were, there were going to be a lot of welding in this structure due to welded profiles, they of course wanted to minimize the work. So I had to stick to uh, larger welds, uh, uh, smaller welds. And also some other issues was that when you're having these profiles, like for example, this is the facade columns that you see here. These facade columns are actually approx approximately, uh, the, 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 the section is one, th uh, one meter in height, so 1000 millimeter. And uh, uh, the facade beam are connected to the end 
of, of these columns. And also I had these trust system uh, stabilizing. Now, w w one problem that I got early in this structure was that since forces are going through the eccentric uh, part, so it's not going through the centroid of the section, it's, it's pretty much on the top. And that eccentricities, and this is, this structure is approximately one meter, the, these, uh, this section is approximately one meter in depth, that would cause an eccentricity of 0 0.4 meters that will create torsion in that in that column. So um, I needed to consider that and I did some tests and I added these these uh, these eccentricities to see if I had to consider them during the design and how much problem they actually created. And in this case, I was actually able to see that th those kind of uh, twisting forces, there's, uh, um, uh, it was okay actually. It was it did it did not uh, uh, sig significantly uh, change a lot. So so. Uh, other than that, um, another problem that I had with these structures was a large deformation during the corners. And I will show you this in the FEM model, how, how it looked. So the, the picture you're seeing here, uh, I can start with going back to that picture, but the picture you're seeing here is this high uh, building part. Now, this structure was actually divided in three parts. You can see the middle part, and then the low part, and this is the high part. So I'll be mainly talking about uh, this high part, but I will also explain uh, some other stuff about the other parts. The reason for that is that they are actually stabilized in different ways. Now, in this part, the, the high part, we are pretty much stabilizing only with, with the truss elements. So we are stabilizing with braces. Now, in this part, uh, there was a mix of stabilizing because uh, you can see that in the high part, we do have braces on uh, horizontal uh, braces on, on the roof. And uh, these braces are supposed to take the wind loads. But in this part, we don't. Uh, and the reason for that is that we, uh, in this part, use it the, uh, the trapezoidal steel sheet uh, to stabilize the structure. So, and also, that is also one of the strengths in FEM design. In FEM design, you can actually, what I did was that I, I actually just brought a, a, a AutoCAD of a section of a of, of the trapezoidal steel sheet, and I drew it in the section editor software that is uh, in FEM design, and it will automatically create uh, a cac it will automatically create a section and calculate the stiffnesses in in plane stiffnesses, and uh, of course out of plane st stiffness also. So it, it gives you that stiffness matrix, calculates it for you, and then you can use it as a uh, as a semi rigid diaphragm. So I use that one to stabilize. Uh, I did not want to use a rigid diaphragm because this is not how that structure would react. So especially in the case of trapezoidal steel sheet, uh, a lot of times you need to use a, you need to use a, a semi-rigid diaphragm. Uh, you could simplify. You could say that well, I'll pretty much I'll, I'll take everything with the braces. But yeah, uh, you should know that in most in cases, at least in Sweden, you're allowed to. And I think there are some countries that where you're not allowed to use the trapezoidal steel sheet as as stabilizing that way. But you're allowed to use it in Sweden. Um, so uh, the project uh, you can see here uh, now. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, it was three buildings stabilized in different ways, and uh, I used a, a trapezoidal steel sheet. But uh, I also, uh, in the lower part that I showed you before, in the lower part, I, I, I had to actually stabilize. I, I was not able to have any braces at all, no vertical braces or an, and no horizontal, meaning nothing in the roof and nothing in the walls. So um, this made that for me to stabilize this structure, I had to stabilize by the joints, so the column joint, and I used FEM design for that. And I'll also show you how, how you can do that. Um, so yeah, uh, now I can quickly show you some of the pictures, how it looks, but uh, this is the structure here, actually. So these are the vehicle cranes that are supposed to uh, park inside and get maintained. Uh, this is a, a structure while they were working, and you can see the the scale of this structure. Um, and uh, actually, the structure of the structure behind it has it ha over there. This is also one of the buildings that I was the design uh, engineer for. So I, I'll probably talk about this building another time. But this was a concrete building. We also had some issues, some challenges with that. So 
that would be for the next or for another webinar and this is a picture from inside this building how it looks um, so yeah and by the way, you can find, uh, if you write Nurvik Sun in YouTube, you can find a lot of these pictures because uh, this is actually something that you can find in YouTube. Uh, it's a it's very good video about this project. But now let's get back to Fem Design. Now uh, in Fem Design, what I did when I started this calculation was that uh, before doing any, you could say, non-linear calculation, I wanted to make sure that it's okay with linear. Uh, now, one thing to think uh, I, I wanted to, 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 to check was that do I have any uplift forces in the structure or not? And during the calculation, I applied these wind loads. And the wind loads was also calculated by FEM design. It was, it's a macro function that you use and it applies the wind load according to the Euro code. And the, when the wind loads are applied, uh, I, I'll, I'll try to see if I find any, if I have any, any uplift forces. And in this uh, you can see in this area that I zoomed in, you can see that I have some forces pointing down, which means that this is tension forces, so this is uh, uplift. So linear calculation so that I had uplift problems locally. Now, uh, in, at, at first, the uplift calculation was much larger. And after that, I added the dead weight of the foundation and stuff like that, and then I was able to reduce it a lot. And uh, after that, uh, I what I did was that when I had these uh, these uplift forces, was that I uh, used um, a, a nonlinear calculation, plastic calculation in FEM design, where what I did was that I assumed that that uh, the pla I, I I didn't allow the structure, or I didn't allow the supports because there is a surface support under this. I did not allow the surface support to be able to take any tension forces so that this would allow to uplift. And I allowed to uplift and then I checked what is the deformation. So this uplift deformation, how much did it actually create uh, as a deformation? How much extra deformation did I get? Can I neglect this or do I have to consider this? And it showed very, very small values. So it was approximate to one or two millimeters so it was very very low and when you see that in a structure when you can see that yes if uh, that, that 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 these uplift uh, deformations are very very small uh, a lot, uh, what i've seen that a lot of engineers they actually design for those forces they if they see any uplift forces they immediately think that well i have to attach something to the rock to not allow this structure to lift and uh, I, I assume that there is actually a lot of structural engineers that will do this but to remind that that allow it to uplift and see what kind of consequence it, uh, you can get in the FEM model. The FEM model will show you exactly uh, what will happen. And most of the times, a lot of times in my case, I've been able to neglect that. Uh, but also these uplift forces, I needed to consider some other thing. Like for example, I had this column standing on a, on a wall. So the column standing on a wall, I also had different braces connecting to it. Um, and uh, since this column, so if for you could say that for this uh, for this to be able to be uplifted, this column have to be in tension. So this gave me some information that well, maybe this joint I have to design for it for for large tension forces. So this column wants to uh, lift from the wall. Uh, and also I have some other forces coming in, but it's very hard to see all these normal forces and try to understand what is the resultant of the forces, in which way, how much shear force it is and how much uplift it is. To solve that problem, I used a tool in FEM design, which is called point connection. So you pretty much add a point connection, attaching it to the column and attaching it to all the braces, and then you get a resultant. And in this case, I got that I have an uplift force on that column that needs to be attached to this wall that, that is approximately 400 kilonewton, and I had a shear force of 342 kilonewton uh, at the same time. So I needed to take care of these uh, forces, and with point connection, I could directly get those forces and use it for, for design. Um, and uh, you can see here some of the joints that uh, I used actually in FEM design. We can start with the roof truss. So this is how the roof truss uh, system, uh, and you can see that these joints was actually designed by FEM design. And uh, I used the joints in steel joint and I got uh, the utilizations here. You can see that the maximum utilization in this case was 90 percentage, which is pretty high. But uh, so this was the joint utilization calculation. Um, 
and uh, and this is how it looks when you add the forces in fem design uh, the facade columns that I just mentioned before, they had large deformation. Uh, and the, the facade columns, those joints were also designed with FEM design. So I used the FEM design uh, uh, and I used it live in the model also. So you can apply a joint live in the 3D structure model uh, um, and it will, it, will, it will use the forces coming from all these different load combinations, use the maximum forces and then it will design this for you. And uh, I was talking about these columns connecting several braces and uh, designing this joint. And this is what I did in the end. So uh, I had to make sure that I had enough joint and I, need, I, I was able to take all the uplift forces. So this is how it looked. Uh, and this is the model from, from Tecla, how it looked when it's connecting it. And this is how it looked then in FEM design. Uh, so, and... Uh, I won't be talking too much, but I did some tests according to, you know, comparing FEM design and a, more a, a general uh, finite element software design joints, and I got very similar results. But uh, uh, now let's talk about a little about, about uh, the model. So how, how come the model uh, looked as it did? So when we see, this is the FEM design model. Let me turn on the thickness. So this is the FEM design model. Now in this model, as you can see, I have these roof trusses over here, and uh, uh, I have these huge openings over here. And I added, I, this is the braces that you can see how I decided to stabilize. And uh, one of the things that I needed to consider that was actually a problem from the beginning of the structure that I actually solved in a maybe a different method. But as you can see here in the corners, I've added some horizontal. Uh, these ones, these horizontal braces in the corners. The reason for that was the huge deformation I got in the corners. Uh, maybe I can show you how the deformation looks at least uh, right now. So I'll turn off the thickness so that you can see how it looks. Uh, and uh, let's, yeah, we can, we can check this place. So as you can see here uh, in this part that I get, I got a rotation here. Uh, the the deformation from this point to this point, uh, right now it looks pretty reasonable, but before adding those horizontal elements in the corners to, stiff, to stiffen up the corners, this deformation was too large. So you could see that if I increase this a little, uh, I got a shape that looked like this, and this also created some torsion on my columns. So to avoid this problem, because uh, the deformation, uh, the deformation, the total deformation was not high uh, going from this point to this point, but the problem was the uh, the angle. So the angle was too high, and this would cause damage on the facade if we had even regular winds. So I needed to stiffen up with these uh, uh, horizontal uh, braces. So in all the corners of the building, I added these ones to stiffen up the corners. And also, uh, 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 you can see that a, a section like this, as, as these columns, uh, let me add the stiffnesses and let me also turn off the covers so that you can see the structure. So a structure like this, uh, you can see that uh, since it's, it's pretty much HEA 1000 profiles, um, I, I got very large rotation. It's very easy to rotate this kind of structure around this, its, it's, its weak axis. So uh, that was a little about the modeling. And I, as you can see, I also model, modeled uh, this roof process pretty much exactly how it looked. Because in this case, I needed all the forces, the exact height, the exact slope of the forces, everything to to match. I know that some so, some make simplification and just add a uh, maybe add a uh, a simple beam or whatever with the same stiffness. But in this case, since I was going to design everything with the same model, design everything with the same model, and uh, use the steel joints with the same model, I wanted the model to be pretty much impeccable. Uh, and uh, Let's go to some other results. So uh, uh, in FEM design, at least, uh, you can see that the forces I have here, now I'm checking some plastic calculation. What I did to get this result, this is to find the uplift places. What I did was that when I went to the surface support here, I, uh, I, I changed the, uh, the, um, the values here. So what I did was I added a plasticity 
and I added the plasticity so that it can take zero, so that everything that creates some kind of uplift or some kind of tension, it will redistribute and uh, uh, the supports at least are not, uh, so should not be able to take these forces. Um, so this is a solution. There is also another function where you can actually detach the behavior, but I find this iteration working at least in my this project very uh, more useful for this project uh, using plasticity. And uh, everything was designed in fem design. The joints were designed in fem design. The trusses were designed in fem design. The columns, the beams, and uh, yeah, everything possible. Uh, and uh, I'll also show you how I uh, how, how I used the you could say the stiffness is coming from the joints. So uh, I have an another model here, uh, which was from the low part of the building. And in this model, you can see that I have uh, columns and the columns are supposed to be fixed. Now these columns, uh, they, uh, uh, I needed to calculate the exact uh, stiffnesses uh, because the, the joints that I will be using was semi-rigid. Um, now, uh, what you can do is pretty much you can add a connection. You can create a connection by just uh, in this one. In this case, I just choose the column base, and I choose this uh, this this you could see joint, and I can then go inside this joint and uh, change the values, uh, change the calculation, and uh, uh, in most of the cases, or uh, you will get forces ready. All the forces to this joint will be automatically taken by the by the three D structure model. Uh, but you can also uh, create your own forces, and this is what I will do now. So I'll pretty much just show you quickly. So I'll pretty much add minus 200 here, and then let's add a bending moment of 30. Uh, let's add a name also, something like this. And what it will happen that the program will do a joint calculation. It gives me 26 percentage, uh, percentage of utilization. But I also have something here that I think is very good to have. And this is what FemDesign gives me. FemDesign gives me the stiffness calculation of that joint. And what you can do is that you can uh, take the stiffness calculation uh, in FemDesign. Once you apply the joint, you pretty much just click finish. Then it will apply the joint on this structure. Uh, and then afterwards, you can actually use this value, which is called stiffness. What it will do is, is that all the joints that you've added that have a certain type of stiffnesses, it will uh, put it in the structure so that when you do a new calculation, it will be according to these new stiffnesses. Um, so this was a, a very useful tool in fitness, and I had to use that in this structure. Uh, because in this structure, especially for some of the elements, I needed to calculate the exact stiffnesses, and it was for these beams. Because these beams are supposed to be some consoles, so standing in here, you would like to know the exact uh, the exact stiffnesses, partly because any vibration or deformation. And uh, to do that, I used also fem design. I created a you could say an isolated model where I had all these different columns, and I added different stiffnesses to see uh, how 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 I would get the result. So in this case, I added a complete stiff. Um, complete stiff connection but in this case what I did was that in the end of the beam uh, I added the stiffness from uh, let me okay I think something happened there ah perfect so you can see the the stiffnesses that are added on the end of that beam to this column and this way I, I considered the real semi-rigid stiffness and see what kind of rotation I got so that was at least some of the some of the things I did. We uh, we unfortunately we don't have time for much more. Uh, but uh, please, if you have any questions about this model, if you have any any uh, questions on how I solved this or that, and um, Uni mentioned a lot of uh, the solution that I did. So in this in in this project, I, I did both a second order calculation because you can actually consider second order effect two ways. One, you're doing a first order calculation; the other one is doing second order calculation. You can, in both of cases, you're actually considering second order effects. But um, when you're doing a first order calculation, the second order effects is included in the design. Uh, while you're doing second order calculation, it, it's it's also included in analysis. So you have to uh, you have to uh, analyze and do a uh, analysis just to see. What, which type will give you a yield in a, in a good result. 
and I did both of them in these cases, and uh, uh, especially when you're uh, defining buckling lengths in in a structure like this. For example, if we take this column, these columns, for example, these tall, slender columns, one common mistake uh, why people haven't used might it maybe find it element softwares for a long time uh, is that when they define a buckling length, let me just hide this. Uh, let me just hide this result. Hide. No. Uh, so when you're doing this, you're pretty much. I'm trying to hide this result. Let me see if I get it. It's getting too much. Um, but let, I can show you that anyway by doing this. So what you can see in these columns is that I've, I've pretty much activated what's called buckling length so that you can see what buckling length you're, you're assuming. Now you can see that for these columns, the buckling length automatically in, in, in softwares, I mean in general, that it will add it between the ends. Even if you're, you've drawn the column all the way, so if you have one single column, the buckling length, length will be divided where all the incoming elements will be connecting to it because it assumes that there will be some kind of uh, stabilizing effect in those parts. But in this case, I don't because this column will pretty much buckle the whole way because uh, out of plane, I don't have anything here to stabilize. And uh, what you can do is that, of course, you can do it th three ways. You can, uh, one of the way is usually to just uh, manually, when you're choosing buckling length, you're drawing your own buckling length. So you can change the beta factor. You can say that, well, the buckling length is not from here to there to this column, it's all the way. So you pretty much draw, you pretty much draw the whole buckling length to the top of the column. And then you will get one big buckling length. And you have to also have to think about the beta factor, and uh, that's when it comes to to, to this second uh, solution is to calculate automatically the beta factor by the software. There is a method, according a simplified method according to Eurocode that you can use in some limited ways, where you can calculate it it automatically for you. And the third one is of course using second order calculation, where you get uh, all of this calculated in the background automatically, and you don't have to define buckling lengths. So yeah, now I think I've uh, pretty much gone over the time, but um, that was at least this for this structure and the challenges for this structure. Uh, so that was for me. Do you have anything to add, uh, uh, Flavio? Thank you, Siavash. I just wanted um, to thank you and Yoni and everybody for attending the webinar. Please uh, visit our website. www.strusoft.com. Here you can find also a little bit more information about this project in our case studies as written down in an article. And also apply for a trial for FEM Design and use it on your own projects. If you go to Get Started Now, apply for a trial license and fill out this form. Also, you can contact us at any time using our contact information, also available on the website. Thank you again and have a great rest of the day.